All right, guys, as I said, we're going to be in the book of Jude. In fact, we'll be finishing the book of Jude tonight. So if you would turn to the book of Jude, just one chapter. And uh, let me just uh, say this. Uh, we have been spending several weeks studying this first main section of the book, which covers most of the book, by the way, it covers, uh, covers uh, verses 3 to 19. And uh, in this first part of Jude's epistle, he talks about what we need to fight against, what we need to fight against. And now as we enter the final section, verses 20 to 23, uh, it deals with what we need to live for. So two main points. The first, verses 3 through 19, I've called a call to action against apostasy. And then tonight we'll look at a command to Christians to live faithfully. As I look at verse 20, the beginning of that part of that verse, Jude said, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your, more, on your most holy faith. Now, guys, each of us has the responsibility to build ourselves up on our faith. And it's not really in the faith. It's on the faith because Jude uses the metaphor of building and faith becomes uh, the, the foundation, and we'll just look at that more in a second, of what we're going to build our Christian lives upon. But each of us has the responsibility to build ourselves on our faith, our Christian walk and uh, our Christian life and so on. The faith Jude mentions here is the same faith he talked about or mentioned in verse 3, where he said, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Now, when Jude uses the definite article in front of the word faith, he is using it then as a noun, as a noun, something that is, and not as a verb, something we do as an exercising faith. He's got in mind the faith, the faith is the body of God's truth that we call New Testament doctrine, including uh, the gospel, of course, but encompassing the entire body of New Testament truth, the church in general, and we in particular have built our faith upon. Now, you don't have to turn to it, uh, but I'll just read to you Ephesians 2, verses 20 and 21, because Paul talks about this. He said, the church having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. You understand that? It grows, the church, as a holy temple in the Lord. We need to be careful not to, uh, not to misinterpret what Paul is saying here. He isn't saying that the, the apostles and prophets themselves were the actual foundation of the church. Uh, what Paul is saying is that the apostles and New Testament prophets were divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit and given God's revelation for the New Testament period. In other words, the doctrine the church is built upon. We read in Acts 2.42, the early church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. The word doctrine simply means teaching, teaching. This teaching is called the apostles' doctrine because it was, re it was revealed to them by the Holy Spirit, which meant it was really God's doctrine, okay? In other words, his word, his word given to the apostles who then taught it to the church, but of course most of it was written down and became our New Testament. The word of God as we have seen from Ephesians 2 and other places, the Word of God is the foundation of our faith. And what we then build upon, see, I mean, the, the Word of God is the foundation for our faith, and then we build upon that. We build upon that um, our Christian lives, our Christian lives. Uh, kind of like a high-rise, uh, we keep building our personal Christianity up and up more and more, on this foundation, as we become more and more like Christ, as we gain more experiences in serving the Lord in ministry and so on. But also, as we just read in Ephesians, that 
the foundation is laid and then the church itself grows uh, larger and larger as more and more people, more and more convert, uh, converts are added to the church. And so you get the idea, okay? But our faith is built upon the word of God and upon that then we build our Christian lives and of course the church in general. Now, Satan knows that the quickest way to defeat the local church is to destroy the foundation upon which it is built. Psalm 11, verse 3 says, If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Satan knows this. He knows the word of God is the foundation upon which our faith, which our church, our lives are built on. And so he's uh, all about attacking the word of God. Now, I don't have time tonight to get into a whole study on that. We may do that in the future. I've done it in the past. But um, understand this. The devil's main attack is always going to be on the Word of God. The Word of God, upon the, he's, it's always going to be directed at the doctrinal foundation that our faith and the church have been built upon. But but look, listen. When we talk about how that you know the devil wants to bring down the church, destroy the church. He does that by attacking the Word of God. The church is nothing more than individual believers that have uh, that have banded together. Uh, sometimes in families, sometimes as just singles, but have banded together, come together to form a local church. Okay, the church is individuals, uh, you know, not the building, of course, but the people. But uh, the way we build ourselves up on our or up upon the faith is that we listen, read, study, listen to meditate upon and memorize God's word. Now, when I got saved, those were the five fingers of the hand that grabbed the Bible. And on each finger, they had something written. So one finger was to uh, to read the Bible, then study the Bible. Then uh, it was to listen to the word of God being taught. And of course, today you can go online or you could the radio or uh, maybe an MP3 player. You take a walk but also then to meditate upon. That's kind of a lost discipline um, where Christians used to really meditate on the word and God would really speak to them. Uh, I don't do it enough. I still do it quite a bit, but I don't do it enough, I'm sure. And, and then finally to memorize the word of God. Another, I think, uh, neglected discipline where Christians, I don't think, are really hiding the word in their hearts the way they used to. But this is what uh, we need to do to build ourselves up on our most holy faith. Um, we read in Acts 20, verse 32, Paul said, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word, God's word of his grace, which is able to, listen, build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. Guys, we build ourselves up on our holy faith by following Jude's simple outline. And it starts with the word of God. It always starts there, always. And when it comes to God's word, there are two primary ways, two primary ways we need to approach it that our faith, and ultimately we're talking about our relationship with God, will be built up, strengthened, that it would grow, all right? And that is we must look at the word, first of all, it, two things, okay? Two primary ways to approach God's word, learning the word and living the word. Learning the word and living the word, and really they're flip sides of the same coin, you might say. Um, the, the whole goal of learning is living, all right? And you can't live what you don't know, so obviously they go hand in hand. But learn, and we could look at tons of scriptures. I'm just going to give you two, one on each point. Learning the word. <clears throat> 2 Timothy 2.15, I'll read it to you out of the King James where Paul said, study to show yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Before we can rightly divide the word of truth, right, we need to know the word of truth. We need to know God's word. We must study it. We must study it, okay, learning the word. And of course, of course, that then leads to living the word. And for that, I have you turn, or I'll just read it to you, if he, uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 to 14, where the writer says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers of the word of God, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, 
and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, mature, those who by reason, listen, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And the point the writer is making is that you can go to church and you can hear the word of God taught every week. But if you really are not serious about applying it, if you really don't put it to use in your life, um, you're not going to grow. You're not going to grow. You, you may have a lot of head knowledge, but uh, if you don't intend to leave church and apply what you've learned, you'll, you're not going to grow as a Christian, as the idea. So that's just part of the way we we um, build ourselves uh, upon our uh, faith is, is through the word of God. I, I will read you one quote from uh, Bible commentator William MacDonald. He said, and I quote, the word of God is certainly central in spiritual growth. I have yet to meet a strong, fruitful Christian who ignores his Bible. We must daily spend devotional time in the word, seeking the mind of God. We must also study the word regularly in a disciplined way so that we better understand what it teaches. So I just talked about that. The gifted Chinese preacher, Watchman Nee, used to read through the New Testament once a month. Now, if you want to do that, you gotta, you got to cover nine verses a day. All right, you go through the whole New Testament in one month. If you read nine verses a day, not a lot. Uh, I'm sorry, not nine verse, nine chapters. I'm sorry, nine chapters. Uh, you will read the entire Bible through in a month. And but he said that um, this becomes apparent when you read his books. That Watchman Nee was a great man of God. I've got uh, some of his books, phenomenal. Uh, he said, uh, uh, the members, uh, he said, um, this becomes apparent when you read his books, for you are struck with his wonderful insights into God's word. The members of the Chinese church used to have a saying, no Bible, no breakfast. If we followed that motto in America, I wonder how many Christians would go hungry, end quote. I don't know. The next thing Jude says we must do to build ourselves up on our faith is praying in the Holy Spirit. See the end of verse 20 there? Praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are many charismatic Christians who interpret, who interpret this as a reference to praying in tongues. Praying in tongues. Now, that might be part of what Jude had in mind when he said that. But I think primarily he means that believers are to pray, listen, as guided by the Holy Spirit, as opposed to praying, we'll say, uh, in the flesh uh, for things that will gratify the flesh. You remember what uh, John said in his first epistle, chapter 2. He said that uh, all that is in the world is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. These are not of the Father, but are of the world. And there's a lot of worldly Christians who pray all the time for worldly things, uh, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life things. And uh, there are churches, many of them are teaching them that this is a good thing to do, that godliness, being a Christian, is a way to get wealth and success and so on and so forth. But that is not what Jesus taught us about prayer. Uh, I'll give you one passage, John chapter 16, uh, spoken by the Lord the night before the cross. So he was just hours from the cross at this point. And he said to his disciples, now this is uh, uh, John 16, verses 23 to 24. He said, uh, in that day, you will ask me nothing. I'm going away soon. He told them that in chapter 14. I'm going away soon. In that day, you won't be able to ask me anything. Most assuredly, I say to you, Whatever you ask the Father, listen, in my name, he will give you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. And when Jesus said, in my name, ask the Father, some Christians think that, well, you know, you finish your prayer with in Jesus' name, like putting a stamp on an envelope and uh, mailing it uh, up to heaven kind of a thing. No, uh, you know, when, when Jesus said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, 
what he was saying is whatever you ask the father that's consistent with my character uh what i have uh uh, uh presented well how i have lived my life what uh, I have uh, said was important and so on. If you ask the Father uh, for anything in my name, in other words, things that are consistent with who I am and my mission on earth, he said, I always do those things that please the Father, right? Um, he was all about serving his Father, building the kingdom and so on. And so Jesus said, look, if you have any need for the work of the kingdom, you ask the Father in my name, and he'll, I'll make sure you get what you need to do the work I've called you to do. But that's prayer, all right? That's prayer. It's not asking for a bunch of stuff that's going to gratify our flesh. It's always about the work of the kingdom and God's will and so on. And so I believe that Jude has in mind prayer that is being led by, listen now, when Jude talks about praying in the Holy Spirit, I believe he has in mind uh, prayer being led by the Spirit of God in, the, in accordance with the will of God as revealed in uh, the Word of God. This is true prayer. Led by the Spirit of God in accordance with the will of God as revealed in the Word of God. This would be in contrast to prayers which are recited mechanically and repetitiously as Jesus taught his disciples not to do. Uh, Matthew 6, verse 7, Jesus said, When you pray, speaking to his disciples, he said, Do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. When Jude admonishes us to pray in the Holy Spirit, verse 20, remember it comes right after verse 19, where he was warning Christians to be aware of apostates, whom he said are sensual persons who cause divisions, listen, having not the Spirit. Look, unbelievers, of course, I don't care how religious they are, they do not have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. And uh, they can still pray and often do. I mean, as a Roman Catholic, I prayed a lot. Uh, I was taught how to pray by the church. And uh, But I was taught to pray vain, repetitious prayers. In other words, you know, I would go to confession, confess my sins to a priest, which I realized as I read the Bible, that was not the right thing to do. You confess your sins to God. But I was taught in the Catholic Church that I would be given a penance. Uh, and usually the uh, priest would give me, you know, like 10 Our Fathers and 10 Hail Marys to recite as my penance. I'd come out. And I'd rattle through those things without even thinking about it and just, you know, high speed. Um, and that, that's, and I, I had done my duty. I was good. Okay. But that is not true prayer. All right. True biblical prayer is simply talking to your heavenly father from your heart. Um, as a child would talk to their loving earthly father, assuming their father is a good and loving man. All right. And remember, that true prayer in the Holy Spirit is not about getting our will done in heaven. It's about getting God's will done on earth. This is very important because some people have a concept of prayer is that they become salesmen and have to sell God on what they want him to do for them. And if they can frame it in the right way and present their case in the right way and kind of butter God up, you know, he's going to give them what they're asking. Uh, that is not biblical prayer. It's not getting our will done in heaven. It's getting God's will done on earth. Again, I always have to qualify when I say that. God doesn't need us. God doesn't need us. He's not dependent on us to get his will from heaven to the earth. All I'm saying is that God knows what he wants to do. His will has been decided in heaven. And now he looks for people on the earth, believers, that he can work through to bring his will to the earth. Again, he doesn't need us, but has chosen to work through his church, uh, in the Old Testament, we read the eyes of the Lord go to and fro about the face of the whole earth, looking for those whose hearts are right with him, that he might use them to show himself strong through. God's looking for people to use. He's looking. He wants to use you for his work. I'm not worthy. Of course you're not. I'm not either. It's not about our worthiness. It's about our availability. All right. It's not, you know, we think we, I'm not able to serve God. Of course you're not. Nobody is. But whom the Lord calls, he equips, right? And it's not about ability, it's about availability. Here I am, Lord, use me. Simple prayer, God says, okay, 
fighting because it's always about his power uh, using us, not about how great we are or and so on. But this idea, you know, you, you can check out 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15, where John says, this is the confidence that we have in him, that whatever we ask according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that we have prayed things that are according to his will, well, we know that we're going to have the things that we have asked of him. On God's timetable, of course, sometimes the answer is not no, it's just not yet. Because for everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. So keep praying. That's why Jesus said when he taught us how to pray in the New Testament, he said, look, uh, uh, you know, ask and keep on asking, the Greek says. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. Because we have to understand that, you know, God may want to do what we're asking him or give us what we're asking him. But he's got a time for everything. So if it's something that's according to his will, um, something that you have read about in his word that God is wanting to do for you, keep praying, keep asking, keep knocking and seeking. And in God's time, he will uh, give you those things or whatever it is. One author said that evangelist Billy Sunday, now he predated Billy Graham, but evangelist Billy Sunday used to give his converts three rules for success in the Christian life. He said that each day they were to read the Bible and let God talk to them. They were to pray. In other words, they were to talk to God. And they were to witness and talk to others about God. It would be difficult, the author says, to improve on those rules, end quote. So we're talking about, you know, how do we grow as a Christian? How do we build ourselves up on our faith uh, in the Christian life? How do we build ourselves? Well, here's three very simple ways right here. Every day, read the Word. Every day, talk to God. And maybe every day, if God leads, talk to somebody else about Jesus. That would be an, a dynamic way to live your life. The third element associated with building ourselves up uh, on our faith is uh, beginning of verse 21 where Jude says, keep yourselves in God's love. Keep yourselves in God's love. Now, notice that Jude didn't say, keep yourselves saved. If we could lose our salvation, no doubt he would have said that. But he's already dealt with the eternal security of our salvation in verse 1, when he said that as Christians, we are, and I'm quoting him, preserved in Jesus Christ preserved in Jesus Christ. And listen, when Jude says, keep yourselves in God's love, he isn't telling us to keep ourselves, you know, so cute and so lovable or so irresistible that God just can't help but love us. I mean, seriously? I mean, come on, right? Um, but nor is Jude saying that keeping ourselves in God's love is dependent on how much we obey God. The Bible says that God's love is unconditional. It's unconditional. And therefore, it's not subject to what we do or don't do. We often think uh, of God's love uh, for us in those terms, that he loves us more when we obey him, and he loves us less when we disobey him. But guys, that's legalism. Legalism is, says if I do this good stuff and obey God, God will bless me. If I don't do what God wants, then God will curse me. That's legalism. We're not under that system any longer. We're under grace. Grace means I get what I don't deserve. Uh, by grace, you have been saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Salvation is not the result of our good works, lest any should boast. We Everything we, we, we receive from God is through his grace, the gift. Grace basically means getting what I don't deserve. I don't deserve anything from God, especially eternal life in heaven. I get those because I believe in Jesus. It's a gift, though, that God gives me eternal life when I put my faith in Christ. But uh, then we well, we have to ask ourselves, then, well, then what does Jude mean when he tells us to keep ourselves in the love of God? Well, he's admonishing us to keep living our lives in obedience to what God has said. Yes, that's true. But listen. He's admonishing us to live our lives in obedience to what God has said so that he can demonstrate 
his love for us in tangible ways. Very important. I've used this illustration before, so bear with me if you heard, if you heard uh, me say it. When my kids were little, their obedience or disobedience didn't affect my love for them. I mean, my love for them was unconditional. However, if they were being disobedient, I didn't stop loving them. That's true. But I couldn't bless that behavior either by taking them out for ice cream. Okay. The blessings I desired to show them were all dependent upon their obedience to the rules their mother and I laid down for our family. Like any good parent, our Heavenly Father wants to bless His children's lives, but only if we obey His will for our lives as laid down in His Word. And again, it's important to note that God doesn't say, if you do what I say, I'll love you. No. He says, I love you no matter what. My love is unconditional. And rather, he says, if you love me, do what I say. Jesus put it this way, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, verse 15. Guys, our obedience to God doesn't earn us his love. But it does demonstrate that we love him. Jesus said in John 15, verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. In other words, I demonstrate how much I love God when I obey what he has said. All right. At the end of verse 21, we see another thing we need to take to heart, uh, that we would build our ourselves up in our uh, on our faith. He says, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. This, I believe, is Jude's way of admonishing us to always be looking for Jesus' return. By saying that I have the rapture in mind, or I, I should say, I believe Jude has the rapture in mind. The word translated looking, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. The word translated looking in verse 21 means earnestly expecting or anxiously waiting for. And carries with it the idea of looking diligently and vigilantly for the coming of the Lord Jesus with great expectation. Paul, in writing to Titus, who was a young pastor, in chapter 2, verse 13, here's what Paul said. He said, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to understand something. When Jude says that we are looking for the mercy of the Lord's return for his church, and Paul in Titus 2 verse 13 says that we are looking for the blessed hope of the Lord's return, both of these men have in mind how the coming of Jesus Christ to evacuate his church off of the earth at the rapture, well, it will mercifully save us from the wrath of to come, or in other words, the judgment of God that will be poured out on this Christ-rejecting world. This is the blessed hope we have. Uh, those Christians who believe we're going through the entire tribulation period, which I don't understand uh, how that is even you know possible to think that, since the tribulation period is all about God pouring His wrath out, His judgment out on uh, on unbelievers, Christ rejectors, and we have received Christ. Peter says. We are not going to be, uh, the righteous won't be punished with the wicked. There's no need for that. We have received Christ. Our sins have been forgiven. Why would God punish us, uh, you know, when he, would, when he judges the world, right? No, our blessed hope is that we're going to be evacuated off the earth before his judgment comes. We call it the rapture, or the scriptures do, that God will take us out of here. This is the blessed hope that we won't be here for the judgment of God. And this is what Paul meant when he talked, or Jude meant when he talked about uh, the mercy of the Lord's appearing, right? Merciful in the sense he takes us off this planet, uh, showing us mercy that he doesn't judge us with the wicked, is the idea. Now, the idea behind when Jude says, looking for Jesus' return for his church unto eternal life might sound a bit confusing, since... As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we already have eternal life. So what is Jude talking about? Well, 
I believe Jude is referring to the full realization of our eternal life. What do you mean? Well, what I mean is that what God began on earth with regard to our redemption and eternal life, listen, he will complete. He will complete when Jesus returns for his church at the rapture and our earthly bodies will be glorified and our redemption will be completed. Now, if you're a little confused, hang on to that thought. Let me read you a few scriptures. You can write down the references, okay? 1 John 3, 2, where John said, Beloved, now are we the children of God. We're saved, right? And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when Jesus is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So what John is saying is, look, we're saved, we're Christians, and yet there's, there's a work that has to be finished yet. And that will happen when Jesus appears, when we're raptured, we see him face to face, and um, we shall be like him as we see him as he is. Philippians 1 verse 6, Paul said, being confident of this very thing, that he who has, listen, begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Or in other words, he will finish what he has begun, the work he's doing in your life and my life, when the rapture happens and Jesus calls us to be with him and we see him face to face and we are instantaneously glorified and uh, made perfect outwardly, even as we are redeemed inwardly. Well, Paul said that in Romans 8, 23, when he said, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the spirit, in other words, the spirit of God lives inside of us, we're, we're, we're saved, we're redeemed. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. So our redemption is not complete yet. I have been redeemed soul and spirit, but this body is still uh, is still a product of the fall. It's still subject to corruption, death, decay, and so on. My redemption won't be fully complete until the rapture when I receive that glorified body. If I have died, my body will be resurrected and then instantaneously rejoined, uh, joined together with my soul and spirit. I will at that time be a triune being, even as God created us to be triune beings, body, soul, and spirit. Um, so uh, we're still waiting for our full redemption to take place, which again will be at the rapture. Now, I know that probably most of you uh, know what Paul said uh, in 1 Corinthians 15. But just in case some are watching that, don't know what that scripture is all about. Let me read it to you. I'll read it to you, the NLT second edition. First Corinthians 15 verses 50 to 53, talking about the same subject. He's saying, what am I saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. Those who have died in Christ, believers. And we who are living will be transformed. Um, and we who are living will be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. And he's talking about how this body uh, will be uh, transformed and, and glorified. And uh, again, from that point, never get sick, tired, never wear out, of course, no death and so on. And so we're waiting for that complete redemption. Now, Jesus said that a faithful servant will be watching for his return. A faithful servant will be watching for his return while the evil servant says, my Lord delays his coming. My Lord delays his coming and then begins to get drunk and beat the other uh, servants and uh, get uh, all uh, occupied with the cares of this life and so on. You can read about that in Luke 12, verse 45. I do want you to turn to Mark, though, because Jesus, again, uh, he um, commanded us to be watchful, to be watchful. Turn to Mark chapter 13.
Mark 13, let's start in verse 32. I think this is an especially powerful um, admonition by the Lord to be watching for his return. Mark 13, 32. However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. And since you don't know when that time will come, be on guard. In other words, you don't know what time the Lord's coming for his church. Be on guard. Stay alert. The coming of the Son of Man can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. When he left home, he gave each of his slaves instructions about the work they were to do, and he told the gatekeeper to watch for his return. You too must keep watch, for you don't know when the master of the household will return, in the evening, at midnight, before dawn, or at daybreak. Don't let him find you sleeping when he arrives without warning. I say to you what I say to everyone, watch for his return. Wow. So we must be vigilant. And let me just say this to you. A lot of Christians are waiting for the Lord's return, but that's different from watching for his return. I mean, I could be waiting for somebody to come. Uh, you know, they told I'll be I'll be, you know, over your house around six in the evening. OK, and um, I'm waiting for them, but I get busy and I get caught up in some things. And uh, they come and catch me off guard because I wasn't watching. Jesus said we must be watching. How do we watch for his return? Well, we know the signs of his coming. The Bible is full of prophecy where Jesus told us and other New Testament writers told us what to look for, uh, signs that will precede his coming. And we are to familiarize ourselves with biblical prophecy of the second coming and, and all. And we have to be then looking at these signs, watching for them, because they will they indicate when Jesus Christ is going to be coming uh, very near. His coming is very near. So we have to be watching, not just waiting. All right, back in Jude, verse 22 and 3. Jude went on to say, And on some have compassion, making a difference, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, even uh, hating even the garment defiled, by the flesh. Now, guys, in these two verses, Jude has in mind those who have been deceived by apostates that had come into the local churches. You remember what he said about these uh, people uh, in uh, verse 4. He said, For certain men have crept into the church unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. These certain men that have crept in unnoticed are apostates, okay? False teachers uh, is the idea. And some of these unbelievers, well, some of these apostates, I mean, let me put it this way, they were all about um, teaching false doctrine. Now, some of these unbelievers... Um, we're not too far gone that they were talking to and, uh, and teaching this garbage. But some of these unbelieving students, I put it that way, uh, at this point were not too far gone, if I can use that expression, in the sense that they, they hadn't yet fully embraced the errors of these false teachers. They still had tender hearts to the truth of God. They were still open, all right? It could be that they still recognized themselves as sinners. And not, you know, perfected saints, quote unquote, as the apostate teachers saw themselves, sometimes even uh, saw themselves as gods almost, had a very high opinion of themselves. But you come across people, Jude says, in your churches that have been influenced by these apostates, uh, but they're not too far gone. They haven't fully embraced all this, this deception of these apostates. He said, and as such, I recommend that you, you know, handle these people with a velvet glove approach. <laughs> Velvet glove approach uh, in that you love them and you show them tenderness and compassion. It's a very important thing as you seek to guide them. Of course, he's talking to those folks back in his day, but it applies to us today as well. When we see these people that have, are starting to be influenced by Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons, and uh, they're still kind of confused. They're not sure what they believe. 
that's a good time to get in there and just gently, okay, just gently and lovingly try to steer them out of the darkness of error into the light of God's marvelous truth. And you do that gently with these people, but then Jude acknowledges that there are others who have wholeheartedly embraced the false teaching of these, you know, certain men that have crept into the churches to deceive these apostates. He said many of these apostates, or let me say, I'm saying, okay, many of these apostates had embraced and taught various forms of Gnosticism. Now, if you want to know what Gnosticism is, uh, get our study in 1 John chapter 1, because we talked about this at some length. But um, those false teachers that had infiltrated the local churches consider themselves to be Christians. Now, these would be these quote-unquote Christian apostates, Christian Gnostics, okay? It's, a, it's an oxymoron, but they considered themselves Christian, even though they were Gnostics and apostates. But uh, these men that had crept into these churches um, consider themselves to be Christians. They consider themselves to be Christians, but they had superimposed Gnosticism onto the Christian faith in an endeavor, listen, to produce a superior form of Christianity. And as such, they consider themselves to be a super class of Christian believers who were so enlightened who were so enlightened that they possessed deeper spiritual insights than even the apostles. That's what they taught. That's what they believed about themselves. These Gnostics were always teaching people that if, you know, people would uh, meditate a certain way, uh, eat a certain diet. They actually had dietary restrictions that would help you to become more spiritual. Uh, if people would chant in the right way and, of course, embrace all the other Gnostic teachings, that all the, it would it would it would mean that all the treasures, all the secret treasures of hidden spiritual wisdom and knowledge would be unlocked to them. See, we have the techniques by which you can unlock these hidden secret treasures, spiritual treasures. The, the apostles don't even know about this stuff. But if you will follow what we tell you, you know, the way you meditate and chant and how you eat and other things that you embrace that we teach. Um, it will unlock all these hidden mysteries, spiritual mysteries, and you'll become more spiritual, have deeper insights than even the apostles have. Well, I'm not going to have you turn to it, but you can read Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, because Paul really came against that hard and said, that's nonsense, okay? For us, Corinthians, uh, Colossians, I should say, chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. All right. When Jude says, on some have compassion, making a distinction, but on others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, he has in mind at this point the militant unbelievers who in their spiritual pride and arrogance look down on what I'll call or what they considered, you know, ordinary Christian believers because they were so superior. And Jude says, with these folks, with, with those that were, you know, uh, that were had not fully embraced some of these false teachings, be kind, be gentle, right? But on those who were militant unbelievers, you know, they were just so spiritually in tune. Nobody else was as spiritual as them. Jude says, with these, get tough. Get tough and tell it to them like it is. Don't pull any punches. Now, do it in love. I mean, you could be hard-hitting and still do it in love, right? I think of Jesus and the way he dealt with the scribes and the Pharisees. He was pretty in your in your face with them. Uh, you would think sometimes by reading the gospel that he hated these men. No, he was uh, frustrated with them because they were so proud and arrogant, they couldn't see that they didn't have um, spiritual knowledge that would have saved them. It was right in front of them. They searched the scriptures every day. Uh, that they might have eternal life, but they testify of me, Jesus said, yet you refuse to come to me that I might give you this life. They're very proud, arrogant people, and yet Jesus still loved them. And yeah, he had to really be firm with them because they were so dull of hearing that he had to kind of get in their faces and, uh, you know, just like what Judah is saying. Uh, you know, some saved with fear, get in their face and challenge them. But do it in love, right? Now, in saying 
that he said, um, some say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, he probably has in mind what the Lord said to the prophet Zechariah and Amos. Uh, in Zechariah 3, 2, God says, is this, speaking of apostate Jerusalem, not a brand that I plucked from the fire? Amos chapter 4, verse 11. God says, I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand plucked from the burning. A firebrand is a piece of wood that's pulled out of the fire and uh, used sometimes for light as they would maybe uh, walk around at night and they pull a piece of wood out of the fire, use it for a torch or uh, to scare away some animal from the sheep or something like that. But it was usually a piece of fire that if left, in, excuse me, a piece of wood that if left in the fire would have been completely consumed, right? God likened some unbelievers uh, like to that. Whereas, you know, they're in the fire, so to speak. They're not in hell yet, literally. But man, the smell of hell smoke is on them already because they're living such wicked lives. And God, his mercy, will do some things to pluck them out of that fire. I think it was John Wesley who said of himself, I was like a burning uh, a, a, a burning brand that God plucked out of the fire. And uh, with some people, you know, uh, they're pretty nice people and they get saved. Okay, great. Um, but others are really bad news, really wicked. And uh, yet God loves them and he saves them. It's quite a testimony. But the Jude says, look, um, whether they're gentle, whether they're very wicked, uh, some say with compassion, others with fear, but it doesn't matter, you know, how you reach them, just reach them for Christ. Some people have said, is it um, right that we scare people uh, by using hell to bring them into the kingdom? I don't care what brings them into the kingdom, as long as they get saved. Uh, if, if it's the love of God, or if it's the fear of hell, I don't care. Whatever it takes, we just want to see them saved, all right? Well, Jude, verse 23 Again, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Listen, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now, guys, Jude's point in saying this is clear and graphic. Look, it's one thing not to come directly into contact with another person's flesh. I'm talking about body-to-body -body contact is in the act of physical adultery or fornication or some other physical form of contact with another person that is sinful and defiling, that's obvious, okay? And let me just say this. We must constantly be careful that when helping someone else, you know, uh, escape what I'll call the quicksand of sin, we don't let them pull us in so that we wind up drowning in it ourselves. Warren Worthy said, in, in, and I quote, in trying to help those who have erred, we must be careful not to be trapped ourselves. Many a would-be rescuer has been drowned himself. When an unstable believer has been captured by false doctrine, we must be careful as we try to help him, um, as we try to help him escape, for Satan can use him to defile us. In trying to save him, we may be stained and burned ourselves. End quote. But listen, Jude was a Jew. And all the Jews knew that even that which comes into contact with defiled flesh, like a garment, well, became defiled as well. Again, Worsby said in the Old Testament, Jews had to be very careful to avoid ceremonial defilement. And this included even their clothing. You can check out Leviticus 13, verse 47, Leviticus 14, verse 47, and Leviticus 15, verse 17, which talks about this, all right? Worsby said, if a clean person, ceremonially clean, touched an unclean garment, that person became defiled, end quote. Now, to make his point even more graphic, when Jude speaks of an unbeliever's garment, he uses the Greek, uh, the Greek word for undergarment. We would say underwear that garment that was right up against his skin, right up against his, his flesh, okay? And when he speaks of this underwear being defiled by the flesh, 
he uses words in the Greek that refer to somebody's underwear being, listen, stained by their own body bodily fluids and therefore defiled. I'll let you fill in the blank, obviously. Um, but he's, he's being very graphic uh, because he wants to communicate how horrendous this really is, all right? Um, this Greek word, you know, you, being defiled with somebody's, by somebody's underwear that was defiled through a person's own bodily fluids. One pastor rightly exhorted, he said, and I quote, just as no one wants to handle someone else's dirty underwear and be defiled physically, so we should be extremely wary of getting too close to the spiritual defilement of those corrupted by false teachers. Even in bringing the gospel to committed excuse me, even in bringing the gospel to, to committed apostates, saints must exercise great caution and wisdom. And then he quotes what Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 16. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents, serpents and harmless as doves. In other words, guys, when we get saved, we need to strip away all the defilements that we used to wrap ourselves in, all the sinful practice, even clothing. I mean, obviously, when a person gets saved, we'll say a beautiful young woman who was very promiscuous, and dressed very provocatively, when she gets saved, she is to jettison that kind of garment, uh, clothing, and wear something modest and appropriate for now a young woman, uh, daughter of the King Jesus Christ. Um, but but there are other practices, and I, again, I don't have time to have you turn to it. But Colossians three, verses five to ten, where Paul talks about the old things we used to wrap ourselves in—the lying, the stealing, the cheating. Uh, the drunkenness we kind of wrapped our that was our kind of our clothing that we wrapped ourselves in but once we get saved we, we are to put all that off and put on the new man which is created in christ jesus under holiness and purity and so on all right let's close we have in verses 24 and 5 jude's closing benediction in verse 24 we read or he says now now to him who was able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Now, guys, with all this talk about apostates and uh, their coming judgment, I'm sure Jude anticipated that it was going to cause many, you know, young believers and, uh, and immature believers in the churches where his epistle was going to be read. Uh, I, I know he anticipated that a lot of these young believers and uh, immature believers would hear him talk about these apostates and their coming judgment in hell and might be prone to think that maybe they too could become apostate uh, in their faith and wind up going to hell as well. In other words, they, might, uh, they, they could lose their salvation and be uh, damned forever in hell. This is why Jude added this wonderful truth in closing his epistle. Uh, now when him was able to keep you from stumbling, stumbling out of Christ and being lost is the idea, and to present you faultless before the presence of God with his exceeding joy. In other words, what he had begun, he's going to finish. What he began on earth, he's going to, to finish in heaven by presenting you to the Father, glorified, faultless, because you're in Christ. You're in Christ, okay? But uh, he added this beautiful truth at the end here because he wanted them to understand that they were absolutely secure, eternally secure in Christ. As a believer in Christ, their salvation was secure. Uh, they were sealed in Christ, and they would never, uh, ever lose their salvation and be lost. And since we studied this topic, when we studied uh, Jude's statement in verse 1, that Christians are preserved in Jesus Christ. We talked about eternal security at length. I'm not going to repeat it, okay? If you're interested, go online and access the uh, second study uh, that we did in this epistle of Jude. The second study, we addressed this uh, topic in detail, eternal security. But I will say this, and then we'll close. This is an extremely precious, this idea that we are, once we're in Christ, we are sealed in Christ until the day of redemption. 
It's, it's an absolutely precious and important doctrine that every Christian should familiarize themselves with, especially if you want to protect yourself against the attacks of the devil who will use condemnation all the time to think you've lost your salvation. Now, I believe that once you're saved, you're always saved. But it doesn't even matter. Well, it does. But even if you're eternally secure, uh, if the devil can think you've lost your salvation, well, he's got you defeated because you'll never live like a victorious Christian if you don't think you are a Christian any longer, all right? And so the idea is that, you know, Satan will try to use this constantly against us. Oh, you didn't measure up. You've lost your salvation, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, you blew it again. You, you're, you're out. God has rejected you, you know. This is why one of the pieces of armor that the uh, Christian is to put on, Ephesians 6, is the helmet of salvation. And I believe what, you, what uh, Paul is talking about is that we need to cover our heads, our minds, in a sense, with this helmet of the hope of salvation. He calls it the helmet of the hope of salvation in, I think, 1 Thessalonians. But the idea is that, you know, the devil has got a broad sword. Uh, one edge is doubt, the other edge is discouragement. And he will use it quite effectively uh, by striking you upside your head in the area of your thinking to get you to think you've lost your salvation so he can neutralize your effectiveness for the Lord, take you out of the race, take you out of the fight, all right? So you need to know these truths about how you're secure in Christ eternally. Put on the helmet of salvation and protect your thoughts against the condemnation of the devil. All right, let's finish. Verse 25, he begins by saying, this is the, the uh, closing benediction, to God our Savior. Of course, when he, he's referring to Jesus Christ, who is both God, second person of the Trinity, uh, and our Savior the only one who could have died for our sins and save us from judgment and hell because he alone is the only man ever lived, ever born, and ever lived a full life that never sinned. He is the sinless Lamb of God who alone could take away our sins by dying in our place on Calvary's cross. Nobody else could have done that. Sinners can die for sinners. that would take the innocent dying for the guilty. And so Jesus Christ was the only one God in human form uh, our Savior, who died in our place, but to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. And I'll leave you with the words of Dr. J. Vernon McGee. He said, and I quote, if you want to know the place that Jesus Christ should have in your life, especially in these days of apostasy, here it is in this marvelous benediction. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, he is God, and he is our Lord. He should be the Lord of our lives. Glory should be given to him. We should glorify him, tell how great he is, how wonderful he is, how mighty he is, and mighty to save. He is majestic. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is mighty, all power. He has mighty all, uh, all power uh, is given unto him in heaven and on earth. This universe has not slipped from under his control. All authority belongs to him. And whether you like it or not, you are going to bow the knee to him someday. I hope you bow the knee to him now so that when you stand before him, then you can bow the knee as a child of God. If you wait to bow the knee to him on the day of judgment, um, you'll be lost as because you didn't in life, receive him as your Lord and Savior. But uh, he uh, finishes by saying, in these days of apostasy, God's children need to bring glory to the name of Jesus Christ and try to hold him up before a gainsaying world. Gainsaying means contradictory and Christ rejecting or denying world. So that's our responsibility, to exalt him, to, uh, to understand his great majesty and power and uh, that we would bow to him now, live our lives in obedience to him, uh, surrendering every area of our life that he might use us for his glory. Then when we stand before him, we can do it with great joy and uh, know that we have lived the life on the earth that was pleasing to him. All right, well, at this point, I would like you to gather your uh, communion elements. We'd like to have communion together. Let me just go over here and... Ready? 
Okay. And uh, I'll let you get your communion elements. I wish we had a little music, but we don't. That's okay. But um, before we partake, I'd like you to bow your heads and just quietly bring your heart before the Lord as you confess to him anything that you need to. Remember now, communion is not for the perfect. It's for sinners saved by grace. But as such, we still live in bodies of this body of flesh, and we're going to still sin. And um, so when we, you know, partake of communion, uh, we want to first confess our sins, that we come to this important um, sacrament with a clean heart. So just take a few minutes and to bring your hearts before the Lord, confessing to him anything you, uh, you need to before we partake. And then as we take the bread, remember how that the Lord Jesus Christ, the night before his crucifixion, in the upper room with his 11 closest disciples, at one point he took the bread and he broke it. They were partaking in the Passover meal. But at one point he took the bread and broke it, gave it to all of them and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you eat this bread, remember me, the body of By his stripes, we are healed. And then our Lord took the cup. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take and drink. This is the cup of the new covenant, which is in my blood, shed for the remission of sins. As often as you drink this cup, remember me, the blood of Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love, wherewith you loved us. Lord, we were dead in trespasses and sins. We were bound for hell. There was nothing we could do to escape that eternal judgment. But Lord, you're, out of your great love, you sent your Son on a rescue mission to uh, die for our, uh, in our place, to pay for our sins, that when we believe in him and receive him as our Lord, our Savior, his blood would wash us clean and give us an inheritance in heaven that will never fade away. And we just thank you, Lord, that um, as unworthy as we are, because of your great love wherewith you loved us, you have uh, offered us the gift of eternal life. life. Thank you, Lord. We ask you to continue blessing our studies in your word. We ask, Lord, that you would end this uh, lockdown quickly. And we can get back to church and, and see each other face to face. Uh, give the governor wisdom, grace, work in his heart, Lord, to allow churches to meet uh, as regular, uh, in regular fashion. We just thank you now, Lord, though. We ask you to uh, continue to bless our church and our studies in your word. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great evening.